Independent YouTubers and Google are at war with traditional media. This advertiser boycott, which is being fueled by most major media outlets, needs to be closely investigated because there seems to be some shady stuff going on, which I'm going to explain in this video. But first, as a brief recap, H3H3, who was prominently speaking out against this boycott and the dangers it posed, made a mistake. As a small part of a much larger story, he claimed that these screenshots from the Wall Street Journal that were ads on a racist video were fake. They weren't. Immediately after realizing this mistake, Ethan took down his video and issued a retraction statement. This is something you will never see the Wall Street Journal or any other similar publications do, at least when it comes to slandering the YouTube platform. In fact, here's a very similar example. Let's compare point by point the mistake that H3H3 made and how he handled it to the PewDiePie hit piece conducted by the Wall Street Journal. I know most of you know about this, but for posterity's sake, let's briefly break down exactly what happened. They took clips from PewDiePie, who makes comedic videos completely out of context and compiled several of these clips into a video in order to slander him. They labeled PewDiePie as anti-Semitic for jokes he made, while comedians, TV shows, and even the authors of the article attacking him have all partaken in similar types of jokes. By that flawed logic, the very writer of this article is also responsible for anti-Semitism, apparently. As a result of this breaking story and the countless others that followed suit, PewDiePie's show got canceled and did Disney cut ties with him. Many YouTubers and people on social media pointed out the blatant slander and hypocrisy publicized by the Wall Street Journal and others in regards to this story. After which, no one was fired, no stories were retracted, and instead the Wall Street Journal and other publications decided to double down and stand firm in their previous positions, despite the obvious character assassination they just performed. What Ethan did was wrong, and criticisms of him are warranted, but the fact that he took down his video and retracted his statements highlights an important distinction here. That is something we did not see with the PewDiePie situation and something that seems to be lacking with reports on this advertiser boycott. I find it interesting that in lieu of these events, most people seem to be focused on the mistake that H3H3 made instead of the bigger picture here. Look, I get it, he made a big mistake and he deserves to be held accountable, but those screenshots were only a small part of a much larger story. Let me be clear with you guys, hundreds of advertisers pulling out of YouTube directly impacts the livelihoods of thousands of YouTubers. And not only that, it also has the ability to permanently change the website to now cater to the needs and wants of these advertisers and pass through their filter. It seems like H3H3 fell into a bit of a pitfall with these screenshots. A far more interesting lead to me are the real motivations behind the advertiser boycott. As I pointed out in detail in my last video that I'm going to briefly go over here, these motivations don't seem to be about racism or hate speech being a huge issue. That actually seems to just be an excuse for other things. What's more likely is that this is a power play from advertisers to gain more leverage over Google and their data. Again, I urge you to read more about it, but this quote is pretty telling of this situation, I think. From the Business Insider article, this UK advertising executive said, quote, If we put YouTube inventory through our filter, we will clean it up, make it safe, and make a fortune on the side. It's pretty clear that these hateful and racist videos are a problem that's being greatly exacerbated and in fact there's much more going on behind the scenes. And yet, most media outlets are only interested in propagating the narrative that these hateful videos are the core of the issue. Let's take a look at just a few examples of this. Now, you've probably heard of this abhorrent slander published by the Daily Mail, authored by Simon Murphy and Andrew Young. I'm not going to spend too much time on this article since Philip DeFranco did an excellent job covering it, but I will point out a few things that he didn't elaborate on. The sensational headline reads, Google blood money. Web giant cashes in on vile seven minute video showing knife expert penetrating a stab vest like the one worn by murdered Westminster police. Aside from being about a paragraph long, already the headline is completely misleading. The original video referenced, made by Joreg Sprav, had no relation at all to the vest worn by Westminster police. And the video merely showcased how ineffective a certain stab vest was. 
But what the authors have slyly done here is connect a terrorist attack to a harmless, in fact, useful video. This article is riddled with the same misleading language, pointing out how Google cashed in on this sickening video. As if to say Google is now linked with this creator who the authors have previously linked with terrorism. Do you see how fucking deceitful this is? The authors reference the video as a sickening display of how to kill someone in a knife vest. The only sickening thing I see here is this pathetic excuse for journalism. As a direct result of this over-sensationalized garbage, Sprav's video was taken down. Because if you haven't noticed, Google has been under immense pressure from the advertisers and dishonest media reports like this. In response, Sprav made a video explaining how he was merely testing a supposed knife-proof vest and how he was wrongfully portrayed in the article. Go check out his video and Philip DeFranco's explanation of it if you haven't yet. Oh, but this next story, this one's all mine. This article on Mashable.com by author Saba Hamadi is titled, YouTubers are mad at the Wall Street Journal for doing its job. Ah, oh, poor Wall Street Journal. They're just doing their job. Please tell me more how these guys on the internet with cameras in their room are bullying a multi-billion dollar newspaper publication. And without exaggeration, the author does exactly that. She claims that despite Ethan's retraction of his video, it's, quote, obvious that the damage to the media company's brand is here to stay. But you're not at all concerned about the dishonest and slanderous reporting that the Wall Street Journal and others have caused YouTubers, are you? You know, because who cares about holding multi-billion dollar media publications accountable? It's those damn YouTubers we should be after. <sighs> And then, with a choice of words on par with most 13-year-old girls, the author then writes, quote, Many journalists did their jobs and, gasp, even broke some news. The Wall Street Journal published a big report, Mashable also investigated, led by Jack Nikas. And then she cites his sensational story of how advertisers are boycotting YouTube supposedly due to hateful videos. I say supposedly because, as I stated earlier, it seems more likely that the ulterior motives are at play here. Look, here's the problem with the Wall Street Journal's report by Jack Nikas and many other media outlets reporting on this. They keep citing these hateful videos as the core problem. But is there any indication of how big of a problem these supposedly hateful videos are? If the best they have are a couple screenshots from the same video in the case of Jack Nikas, and a completely dishonest and mostly fabricated report of that knife vest stabbing video, that says to me that these outlets are mostly just grasping at straws here. Here's an idea. How about before you endanger the livelihoods of thousands of YouTubers and try to irreversibly change the website, you show some proof of how big this supposed issue is. For example, what statistics and data can you show me that shows what percentage of YouTube ad revenue comes from these hateful videos? Is this percentage higher than what advertisers deal with on other similar media platforms? What exactly constitutes a hateful video to begin with? Is it any video with a racial slur in it? Because there's plenty of good comedy that has that. Does it have to be a video involving weapons like a knife or a gun? These are the questions we should be asking and be holding the media accountable to answer. If they came out with solid points to answer all of these questions, I might give the media more credibility in this outrage. But so far, all of these questions seem to fall into a giant gray area and they'd rather focus on these small anecdotal examples without actually looking at the big picture. Once again, I'm going to cite the only article I seem to have found on this topic, which states, quote, It's also incumbent on advertisers to have at least some idea of where their ad spend is going, the executives we spoke to said. For every pop music video or Zoella makeup tutorial on YouTube, it should be no surprise their ads will likely be served against some truly unprofessional content. Any platform that is built on user-generated content carries that risk, something agencies should take responsibility to remind their clients about. Out. Advertisers can also choose not to go there and pay only for premium placements, but most don't as they want to keep their ad spending to a minimum. Clearly, there is some responsibility to be had on the side of the advertisers, which might require a little bit more spending. But nah, let's just boycott Google so we can get them to filter content how we want it. And who cares if that means users will have no creative freedom as a result of these changes. Instead of doing any sort of actual investigative journalism, most of these media outlets are just seeing 
smoke and not looking at the fire. They're placing the blame almost entirely on Google and I guess YouTubers instead of possibly questioning the motives of advertisers. And that's exactly what I mean by a war between the old and new media. These media outlets and advertisers are not working in the interests of you, the user, but rather themselves. Of course conventional media would side with these advertisers and want to see YouTube destroyed. YouTube is the future and this old media is the past. Instead of trying to adapt, they'd rather see the new platform ruined. Anyways, that same garbage article from Mashable.com also talks about the PewDiePie scandal. And surprise, surprise, the author takes the side of the mainstream media. Hamity claims that PewDiePie's refusal to take full responsibility for the media's slander of him caused the normalization of hatred for the media amongst the YouTube community. Who the fuck pays these people? Seriously, do we have to go through what the Wall Street Journal did in their hit piece on PewDiePie again? Either the author is blatantly uninformed and by extension a terrible journalist, or is maliciously being dishonest about this situation. Digging a hole even further, she goes on to say that Ethan Klein has mastered the art of, quote, sorry, not sorry. Oh, so if you don't completely accept the slander published in your name as fact, you're not being an obedient enough servant to the media. No, you have to fucking bow down on both knees to your media overlords, or else you're inciting hatred in the YouTube community. What a fucking joke. Quite frankly, it's appalling to me that articles like these are considered journalism. I have a million times more respect for H3H3, Philip DeFranco, and other YouTubers than I have for these career-destroying, clickbait-driven, journalism school rejects. Once again, the underlying point here should be how big of an issue is hate speech on YouTube really? What the hell is hate speech even? Because so far it just sounds like code for whatever articles can demonize and then get clicks off of. Can we get any sort of concise data showing that hate speech is a significant issue on YouTube and that a significant portion of ad revenue is going towards it? How about more investigation done in line of what Laura O'Reilly of Business Insider did, raising questions of the true motivations behind these advertisers? And finally, in a funny way, the Wall Street Journal's paywall sort of speaks volumes to this whole situation. What it basically says is, we're better than the rest of you journalists. Our newspaper is held to a higher standard. In order for you plebs to even lay eyes on our work, you need to pay us. This is why YouTube is winning. This is why you need to conduct dishonest hit pieces on your competition. And this is why you will not survive. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. You're cool. Fuck you, I'm out. This is the Wall Street Journal. It costs about $3, which is more than any other newspaper I saw. So they clearly think pretty highly of themselves. And this is the future of old media.